together to form a gas lattice. Now, this, the significance of this is that millions of new chemical compounds will come about now because we have a way of joining atoms that heretofore would not naturally join together. But this is an example of using argon atoms with iron ions or copper or, I mean, sorry, nickel or cobalt as an example, that those ions will exhibit the electrical magnetic field because their electron spins in the same directions. Argon, as an example, is ideally used because it is a gas which is a lubricator. It does not like to transmit electrical energy, and it also acts as an electromagnetic shunt. So as a result, we now expose the gas to an electromagnetic field, and now you'll have an electromagnetic alignment, as you see here, that will extend beyond the non-magnetic tube, which transverses the coil to produce electrical energy. This gas, because of its interlocking between the covalent link-up as well as its electromagnetic link-up, gives us the ability now to move discrete magnetic flux lines into tubular pathway, the closed-loop tubular pathway, by which those magnetic links remain intact and in the proper position. We can move the gas by an example of a non-magnetic turbine wheel hooked to, for an example, a, a small electric motor. It only takes several torque ounces to move the gas as opposed to the prior art of moving it in many, many horsepower. As a result of that, we can move the gas in several torque ounces. Now, there's an example of using a non-magnetic turbine that moves the gas to a non-magnetic material, which is copper tubing in this particular case. And as that magnetic field moves through the pickup coils, you're now generating electrical energy and in a very efficient and economic way. We now took the technology further and replaced the mechanic pump with an electromagnetic pump to move the gas without any mechanical moving parts. Basically, what happens is the first coil produces an electromagnetic field that locks onto the gas, and then we deflect the electromagnetic field in a linear direction, and as a result, is now moving the gas without any mechanical displacement. We are doing some unique things on oscillating the magnetic fields in order to achieve maximum efficiency of the generators. This is an example of an electromagnetic pump, EPG electrical generator. Gentlemen, where is the bearing? Where are the contact brushes? If I have a magnetized gas inside the tubular structure way, is that gas basically going to wear out Now we're confronted with accelerating the process to the Star Wars level. We are now injecting laser energy into the gas, and we're allowing the laser energy to be absorbed by the nucleus of the gas, which in turn allow the electrons of the gas to move farther away from its <coughs> nucleus, therefore increase its spin. And under the electromagnetic theory of magnetism, that whenever an electrically charged particle passes through an electric static field, Something's got to happen in the law of physics, and what takes place is an increase in electromagnetic field. So therefore, we are now moving the magnetic field close to the speed of light because a non-magnetic tube is now being converted into a light guide, and the laser energy is no longer being dissipated outside of the light guide. It's being reflected much like that of fiber optics. If we want to compound the electromagnetic field, we simply will hit the gas at a burst of 10 watts of laser energy, and as the, the laser energy passes through the gas and goes back to the original point, we now allow the laser to laze again, and we are now superimposing more laser energy on the process. So as a result, we're now moving a greater intensity magnetic field, and we go around and do the same thing again, and in a re very short period of time, you are now moving a fantastic electromagnetic field of tremendous high intensity. Now, heretofore, as been mentioned in many of the symposium on free energy devices, one of the inherent drawbacks of that type of technology was that you must increase the magnetic field of the permanent magnets. But when you had, when to increase the magnetic field, you had to increase mass. This technology allows us to amplify the electromagnetic fields at many magnitudes without increase, increasing mass, so therefore gave us the ability to overcome the limits of the prior state of the art. 
This is an example of the laser energy being absorbed by the nucleus, causing electrons to go to a higher energy state. And when that occurs, as it migrates from the nucleus, the electron spin increases. And when it increases, you're now increasing the, its electromagnetic fields. Now, we have many other ways to produce the electrical energy from the fuel cell because we are now disconnecting the umbilical cords. The first section of the gas actuated can be used where you can use a Stirling engine to heat the gas to oscillate a magnet, which in turn would produce electrical energy, and you could feed it back through the grid system to the voltage intensifier circuit to restrict the amps and allow voltage to take over. Second area, we can replace the electromagnetic pump or the non-magnetic turbine wheel with an internal combusted engine. But in those two cases, the hydrogen and oxygen atoms are being consumed in the process. Can we now produce electrical energy without consuming the hydrogen and oxygen atoms? And as a result, the next two areas were developed to accomplish the task. Inherently, as you're releasing the gas from water, it produces as a byproduct gas pressure, does it not? And as a result of releasing that gas, you now can allow, as the gas goes through to up or to the nozzle, if you put a turbine wheel and subject it to the gas pressure being escaping, you will turn the turbine wheel which hooks to a second turbine wheel to move the magnetized gas to produce the electrical energy. Now, gentlemen, we're producing electrical energy bypassing thermal chemical interreaction and nuclear interreaction. The only thing I'm using is gas pressure to generate electrical energy. And I'm now producing electrical energy without consuming the fuel source. Another development was called the gas battery or the electrical polarization generator by which we are inherently destabilizing the oxygen atom. We are pulling off its electrons which now takes on a positive electrical charge. We now can direct those positive electrical charges into uh, electrically insulated cavity, expose it to electrical conductive plates like stainless steel 304 material. And we know in physics that when electrically charged particles are exposed to electrical conductive plates, it now becomes positive electrical charge, does it not? And we simply link those electrically charged plates to a terminal and therefore the terminal becomes positive electrically charged and we know in physics that anything in differential of anything will perform work and since we have a positive electrical potential we now can hook it to ground through load and we can cause the negative charge electrons to migrate up to the oxygen atoms on the plates and as a result now produce electrical energy bypassing all mechanical applications. For an example of this is what happens if we would take one billion oxygen atoms that had four missing electrons, how many electrons could migrate to the plates? Well, it would be four billion electrons, would it not? So as the generator is producing the gas, we are now also generating electrical energy simultaneously in the process, and we can accomplish the task in five different ways. So the process is a self-sustaining oscillation system that once you excite it from an external source, it maintains itself as long as there is water in the fuel cell. Now, there's an example of the EPG system now hooked up. That is a composite design of the water fuel cell technology. It was been developed under the principle that, number one, it had that the same engineering design specification of one system would apply to all systems. We have accomplished that to minimize the expenditure in uh, production and distribution. For those who would like to seek additional information, you can contact water fuel cell at 3792 Broadway. If you have a pen, you can copy it down. We'd be more than happy to. Yes. Or, and as I said it a little earlier, you can contact Ike, and he'd be more than happy to uh, get the information or the name and address to me, and I'll send you the information, or he'll send it to you. I now have a little videotape that I'd like you to see, uh, that dune buggy running off of water. Thank you. Yes. You can read the video and send it to you. Yeah, OK. Yeah, yeah. Let me get that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Stan. At this time, we will see the little dune buggy. Stan has to leave to the airport, so please don't bother him too much. And all, who are interested in this technology, 
Sie können sich draußen in eine Liste einschreiben oder mir schreiben oder safe schreiben. Das spielt keine Rolle. Wir werden dann alle Informationen Ihnen zur Verfügung stellen. Activated injector systems. Design, build and test electronic boards for acceleration controls. Perform test evaluation on systems reliabilities. Success is measured by determination to make it work. And successful we shall be. Only on Action 6 News at 6. A car powered by water, a Grove City man has invented it, and even the Pentagon is interested. WTVN-TV Channel 6, Columbia. This is Action 6 News, a 6 o'clock report, with Tom Ryan and Gail Hogan substituting for Michelle Gaillier, Larry Cosgrove with the weather, and Steve Minnick Sports. Let's get back on land to top our news here at 6 o'clock. An age-old dream becoming a reality. A local inventor has discovered a way, hear this, to use water to run your car. It's a major breakthrough that will no doubt make motorists happy. And as Ralph Robinson explains, the Pentagon is also showing lots of interest in this project. Water has always been considered a precious commodity, but Stan Meyer's invention may make it even more valuable. He has developed what's called a water fuel cell. It has taken the place of his old gas tank. The water fuel cell breaks down water molecules into oxygen and hydrogen. The hydrogen is used to run his dune buggy. I don't care if you use rainwater, well water, city water, ocean water. If you don't have any fresh water, go ahead and use snow. If you don't have any snow available to you, they use salt water because there's no adverse effect to the fuel cell. Meyer started working on this project four years ago. He's not a scientist. He isn't even a chemist. In fact, he never graduated from college. Myers was determined, he says, to design something to protect this country from oil embargoes. And we have calculated that if we take the dune buggy from Los Angeles to New York, we would roughly use 22 gallons of water. The Pentagon flew a lieutenant colonel in last week to look at Meyer's invention. There's talk of possibly using it in the Star Wars defense program and to run army tanks. Myers is currently perfecting a water fuel cell for cars. It will cost about $1,500. He says it won't need any maintenance and you won't have to replace it. It'll be at least two years before the fuel system goes into mass production. The day it happens will be one the fuel industry hates, but it'll put a smile on the face of those who've had to say at one time or another, fill her up. I'm Ralph Robbins. As you can see, many patents have already been received. Ich glaube, das war jetzt ein historischer Augenblick für Sie. Das war das erste Auto, das hat Wasser fährt. I think this was a very historical moment for you. This was a car running on water only. <laughs>